Hello and welcome to KingstonCitizens.org's roundtable, What's the Process? Uh, it's recorded, it's been recorded each week and we broadcast a program um, that takes on and tackles local of city, sorry, the local city of Kingston and Ulster County topics with a range of guests. Um, I am pleased as always to be with my co-host Jennifer schwartz -Berkey. We'll introduce herself in a moment. My name is Rebecca Martin, and I am the director and co-founder of KingstonCitizens.org. And I'm Jennifer Schwartz Berkey. I'm a resident of Kingston, an urban planner, and uh, a big supporter of Kingston Citizens since its founding. I was also a county legislator for one term. Great. And to learn more about KingstonCitizens.org, please visit our website at www.kingstoncitizens.org. Um, usually at this point, we talk about our show next week, but we're taking some time off, as I hope lots of people are, even if we're staying at home. I don't know about you, but I've been working 12 hour days. <laughs> it's been a real crunch with all the Zoom meetings these days. Uh, so we'll take a little break. We'll be back with some new topics uh, in, the, in the near future. Uh, but for tonight, um, we have a very special guest and we're going to be uh, discussing our, our topic tonight is the problems in the process of dam removal. And we're joined uh, by uh, George Jackman, PhD, who is the Senior Habitat Restoration Manager at Riverkeeper. Welcome, George. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. So George and I work together at Riverkeeper, and I am really happy to have him on. You know, we've been talking a lot about dams, and I think it's a wonderful topic. I think it's probably not a topic that people think much about, so I'm glad to get into it a little bit and to help to share the work, the work that you do, which has a lot to do with the aquatic life we know of the river. It's your passion. And I'm going to read a short bio about you, George, and then we'll uh, get started. We can hear all about your work. So George is a retired New York, New York Police Department, uh, NYPD police lieutenant who turned aquatic ecologist, uh, an, an experienced dynamic environmental activist with a strong record of achievement. George is working on dam removal, removals in the Hudson River estuary which are considered priority barriers to migratory fish to expand critical habitat for these fishes. He helps Riverkeeper contribute to the restoration of the natural habitat for fish, amphibians, and other species in the Hudson River estuary that are affected by dams and artificial barriers. So aquatic species can migrate to habitats they need to survive, reproduce, and to thrive. George conducts planning, outreach, fundraising, communications, and advocacy to promote fish passage and mitigate the damaging effects of barriers. So that's straight off of the Riverkeeper website, George. And why don't we begin by you giving us a, a, a sense of how you went from your, you know, one lifetime to another in terms of your work. and. Uh, and how you ended up at Riverkeeper and what is your role there? Just give us a good introduction. Okay, um, well, it's a long story, but to uh, make a long story short, uh, I was uh, a member of the NYPD. Um, I, had a, I started with a high school education. I was going, you know, and I wanted to be a cop. But all my life, I was a sportsman, a hunter and a fisherman. And it's not that, you know, I was more of a, a naturalist and I wanted to know more and hunting and fishing gave me the, the, the avenue of which to see these creatures up close. And all my life I was interested in that. And at some point in my career, I decided to go back to college. I was somewhat bored with the job. And, uh, but I, I have a need to champion for people and organisms. Uh, so, I wanted to study biology. I always had a, a, a passion for life and the outdoors. And um, so I went back to school at night and 
You started with a, a, an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and finally my PhD. And, um, but what happened was at some point in my uh, career, I, I guess I got uh, disenchanted and I was offered a, an opportunity to go back to, sc to go to school full time. And I received a, a teaching fellowship and a scholarship for my PhD and my, uh, my master's and a PhD. And I said, I'd be fool not to accept this. And I remember reading a Thoreau and, or a, a Robert Frost poem, The Road uh, Not Taken. And I felt I had to do that. And, and you know, I remember Thoreau saying, you had to dream big dreams and uh, live the life you've always imagined. And so that's what I did, you know, and I just threw all cares to the wind and just, and today, I look back and say it was the greatest decision I ever made. And I'm so happy at what I do today. I'm so pleased with the people I work with. So that's it in a nutshell. And I get to champion for uh, creatures that can't speak for themselves. George, that's beautiful. And I remember your first day and how excited you were to be able to really specifically be at, a, at an organization like Riverkeeper that's mission is the Hudson River and the watershed. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, the things that you did when you first started? So you've been a river keeper for a couple of years. So where you began and where well, you are now in your I'm going to tell you a quick story. I, I remember I was taking a course on the Hudson River when I was in grad school. And I, the last leg of the course, we met John Lipscomb on the river keeper boat. That was 15 years ago. And I said, gee, you got the greatest job in the world. And little did I know, many years later, I'd wind up working for Riverkeeper. And that boat ride really did a lot for me. And so, but how did I wind up? That's part of it. And what I started working on was um, fish in decline. When I was a kid growing up on the South shore of Long Island, fish were abundant and they all seemed to be declining. And so I wanted to go to school to help them and find a way to help them. And I was especially interested in migratory fish. I was, was fascinated by how did they find their way? Or how did they cross this salt barrier and find where they were born? And just my migration, whether I've even been to the, the Arctic bandings geese, and just fascinated by the fact that geese that are born on the tundra know where to go without their parents. It's imprinted and all this migration really fascinated me. And so I wanted to study migratory fish. So as I worked as a research uh, uh, assistant for the New York City Parks Department working on migratory fish. And um, there was an opening at Riverkeeper and uh, people reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to apply. And I said, sure, why not? And, it's, and that's how I started at Riverkeeper. And I'm particularly happy at the job I got is habitat restoration and dam removal. And the point of all this is, this is what I've always wanted to work on. You know, we've ex there's been a, an excessive exploitation and whole scale degradation of habitat. So we reached a point where we need to rebalance the needs of people and the needs of wildlife. And so in this job, I try and help create that dialogue. And this can only be accomplished through community-based conservation efforts. You can't not include the community. We must include the, but why did all these fish? And because we use military technology to overexploit them out in the ocean and we've damaged their habitat so they can't reproduce. They had nowhere to go but down. And 11 of our most iconic species in the Hudson River are now in decline. What are they, George? Well, we could start with the striped bass, uh, uh, blueback herring, uh, uh, alewife, shad, American eel, um, white perch, uh, Atlantic sturgeon, uh, short nosed sturgeon, white catfish. Uh, Lamprey, and, and you hear a lot of negatives about lamprey, but they belong in the Hudson Valley. They are no threat to any fish. In fresh water, 
in the Hudson River. They are not parasitic, and bluefish and striped bass would love to see them, I assure you. They would ravage them, so they are no threat. They're not like the Great Lakes, and that was a man-made problem. So uh, shad and hickory shad, and that's our species that are in decline. So dams along the Hudson River um, and its tributaries, um, I'm jumping off here a little bit because you you you've outlined one of the problems with some of the the fishing techniques that yep. are making it difficult for fish to survive. Don't stand a chance. Uh, right. Can you can you talk us through a little bit about the dams along the Hudson River and the tributaries and the trends and impacts? Yeah. To the problem. Yeah. Um, in the, in the Hudson Valley, there are 1,600 dams in the valley, of all, if you list them all. And then give or take 100, you know, more or less. There could be 1,500, 1,700, so the, our average is about 1,600. That's an extraordinary. Each dam acts like a blood clot in an art, uh, a circulatory system. And now picture if you, you were a living body and had 1,600 blood clots, you'd be in big trouble. That's what we have done to our watershed. And so, and of that 1,600, there's around 300 primary barriers to migratory fish. And those are the ones we really want to target. Those, and then of those, the first ones are the ones we want to, uh, we would love to remove. Uh, they're called the primary barriers, the ones that block them. You know, these, these dams were important for our social and ecolog economic development of this country at one time, but most of them have outlived their use, yet they still form a wall to these fish that need their habitat. Not only that, 60% of the spawning habitat in the Hudson River was lost due to channelization for navigation. And then we put a dam at the Troy, the Troy Dam. So we blocked the upstream passage, and then we blocked all the tribs and we had tribes like Fish Kill Creek. What do you think it was named after fish? Fit, kill meaning the Dutch word meaning stream. So it must have meant there was a lot of fish there. And in a town like Pearl River uh, is named after the pearly mussel. And there are no pearl, pearly mussels left in the Pearl River anymore. So it's very sad. And, uh, you know, one of my legacies I would like to be is that at least I tried to do something. And being an environmentalist, the beauty is you get to change the world. Jenny, do you want? Do you have any questions? Because I could just go if on. So, so um, how does the project prioritize which dams to remove? Well, again, we we look. We want the prior, the primary barriers, but they're not easy to get. There's a lot of resistance for whatever reason. So. I'll take whatever low hanging fruit I could find. Mm -hmm. And so it takes a lot of uh, boots on the ground. You know, we've mapped these, we've looked at them, we've studied them, but we really haven't walked these creeks as much. And so my job is, I, I did a lot of community policing when I was in the NYPD. I love getting out and talking to people. And that's my first job is uh, when I find a barrier, I want to know, one, who owns it? A lot of times we don't even know who owns it. That requires a lot of research. And then I need to know what's behind it. Are there, is there an industrial legacy behind it that we have to worry about in forms of contaminants? And then what's the condition of that dam? That's all, those are my three vital questions. And my fourth one is, who will be impacted if that dam was removed? What houses are, is there an impoundment? Are there houses around there? Will they resist this? Mm. So if I could find low-hanging fruit where it's on state land or something like that, and which I did, because we want to turn the tide. So I look for the low-hanging fruits many times. George, are there dams? Can we start just assuming this is a new topic for, for most people? Are there dams yeah. that, are, that exist that are useful today? And are they, are yeah. they part of the 1,600 dams? that exists um, along the river? You know, there are, each dam has its own history and its own life. And we can't by prescriptive zeal 
assume that all, ba all dams are bad. But the ones that block migratory fish, we would like to remove. And you know, some are vitally important for human infrastructure. Those are not the primary barriers on the Hudson, uh, on the Hudson River tributaries. And the problem is most of these are abandoned mill dams. And so people own those dams and we have to try and convince them. The best convincer we have is they're very expensive to maintain. So we can tell them, you either got to repair it or remove it. What does it cost? I guess they all vary in size. It varies. Each one varies. Mm -hmm. But generally, it's a lot cheaper to remove a dam than it is to rebuild one. Right. So, and that really helps. And when we say, we could help you remove this for free, sometimes that helps sway the balance. So, <clears throat> can we get into a little bit of what the process is for uh, dam removal and, and the problems. I know it's a broad question. And so if, you, if we need to get, I, I just wanna make sure I don't miss anything. So I'm going as broad as I can for you to, to narrow sure. it down. No, and, and <clears throat> dam removal in New York State is a problem. Uh, we are dealing with the largest Superfund site in the country because of a dam removal that went bad. Mm -hmm. And because it wasn't fully investigated that there were PCBs behind the Fort Edwards Dam, they, when they removed that dam, they mobilized all those toxins downstream. Had they done what we do today, cleaned up those, it wouldn't be the problem we have. So since then, New York has been paralyzed by its own inertia. Whereas the rest of the country has been removing dams, New York is still was frozen. Uh, and, but now the DEC has a younger cohort that is working there, a younger generation of people that are more progressive and they have a more progressive viewpoint. They're willing to remove the dams, but they're very cautious about it. So the problem is between the Army Corps of Engineers uh, and New York State DEC, you have to be very cautious. And there's uh, SHPO, uh, if everybody knows what SHPO is, State Historic Preservation Office, we have to, con some things are historic. And uh, in my opinion, history of the European settlement amounts to about that much because we have a geologic history. Right. We have a history of Native Americans that long preceded that little window. Mm -hmm. And I was in Plymouth, Massachusetts last fall and they removed six dams on Town Brook. And they got the wherewithal, this is the most historic river in the United States. That was where the pilgrims met the Wampanoags and the Wampanoags taught the pilgrims to fish. So how did they get the wherewithal to remove six dams? Because they said history is much more inclusive than a small snippet in time. And they also were worried about the impact of the fish to the fishermen, and the community. And what they found out was the homes that were on these feeded, uh, 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 these fetid impoundments, their value skyrocketed by rewilding the creek and revegetating this riparian habitat and putting migratory fish back in. So now they had this beautiful stream and this landscaped uh, riparian corridor with migratory fish rather than this fetid pond that was filled with harmful algal blooms. Their houses doubled in value. So George, I hope that answers the question. Well, it's part of it. I think there, I have more questions and Jenny, I sure would love for you to jump in at any point. But one thing that, that just occurred to me as you were explaining that, you know, we've seen um, community members who get really used to their dams and the impoundments, the ponds that they create, et cetera. And, you know, concerns about what happens if you remove the dam and the water all goes rushing out and there's no more water, you know, can you talk a little bit? So that's, that's sort of the, the restoration sure. process. You know, and, and I fully understand that. I grew up on Long Island and there was a lake I grew up on. I swam and I fished and I camped on the island and that lake was really important. And I really liked, I really liked high school too, but there was a time to move on and there is a time to move on. And, you know, you can't step in the same stream twice. This is an old Zen Buddhist philosophy. 
Time is moving and nothing remains the same. There was a time when we thought they, those dams were good and innocent, and, but they're not. They're harming the fish. And so my job is to create the dialogue and convince people that their dams are anachronistic and it is time to foster a new vision. So what happens, people think, will this be a mud pit? Not at all. You have you no know, faith in nature? Nature abhors a vacuum. The last thing she will allow is a vacuum. And I've been looking at these dams and they're magnificent. They were naturally breached. And what happened, the stream found its own channel. The floodplain just naturally revegetated. It is, and I keep taking snapshots week after week after week after week to show people visually, this is nature. This is, nature is the finest artist. And what we're going to do, uh, we're going to be like, uh, we're going to augment that. And to stabilize the stream, we're going to have a trees for tribs in this little impoundment. So we're going to stabilize it. We're going to get people involved, ducks unlimited, trout unlimited, Audubon, because what happened, this impoundment became a paradise and the owners have realized what a paradise they have. And all sorts of animals are there now, birds and mammals and fish, and they're on board. So we have to use that as an example to say, just trust in the process. So when you begin this process of outreach and you're um, you beginning, let's say, with uh, these groups or these property owners, can you walk us through how you begin to, let's say, educate or, or turn sentiment <laughs> toward you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it all depends. It, you know, it's funny. It's uh, every everyone has a history. You know, sometimes they know me before I even show up. I remember one, I knocked on the door and I say, hi, how are you? Uh, he said, they said, you're the damn guy from River. <laughs> the damn guy. <laughs> yeah. And so I don't know if that's a, you know, a profanity uh, or not. <laughs> so uh, then I usually start the conversation. I say, I want to talk about your dam. And guess what? They love talking about their dams. And then we start talking about their dams. And a lot of times they start to agree with me. And because those dams are a problem, mm -hmm. they're a problem to own. And I picture one uh, because they cause a lot of flooding. And I say, you're on the hook for a lot of maintenance. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is, uh, and, and that pond, we talk about the ecology, most people, are tied into nature and one are really interested in helping nature. Uh, however, I, re I do remember I went to one was buried under, under corporate strategy. Uh, so I had to, it was layers and layers and layers of corporate structure. And I guess being a New York City detective, I uh, was able to penetrate all that. And I knocked on the property manager's office and I was thrown out three times, Forceful, forcibly removed. But I kept coming back. And, uh, you know, I said, you know, there's a reason why I'm here. There must be. And I'm going to keep on. I went back to the guy. And I, because I, I knew I did a lot of research on him. I said, listen, we're the same age. What do you really need at this point in your life? And uh, I'll tell you. So I tell him my story, how I became an environmental activist. Because I wanted to make a difference. And then it appealed to him. And he sat down and he said, all right, let's hear it. Sit down with me and let's discuss this. So we discussed it and he said, Send, write this up and tell me what you want. So I did. And that's how it starts, you know, sometimes. Every dam is different. And every different. every yeah. communication is different. Jenny, can you, sh can you give me sharing privileges here? Because we're- Sure, sure I think I can. Um, George, as you were speaking about the, the restoration, what happens, I pulled up pictures that you had sent um, in, in um, you know, it was your uh, field notes. Yep. 
Um, I want to show them, if I may. Please, go ahead. Please. All right. So I'm going to start by showing the, the first one that, that, um, that shows the dam, right? So what we're looking at here, um, what dam is this? And this is... This is the McKinnon Dam on the headwaters of the Fishkill Creek. Okay. And it's an old, old field stone dam. Wow. So what are we looking at if, in front and in back? We see the creek. We see this, the in front of this is the, the dam. The dam was undercut. It wasn't fully exploded. Last uh, Memorial Day weekend, not this past one, the one before, that we had a big storm. And it breached that whole dam and the pond drained out underneath. So the owners contacted a, a, a dam owner, a, a, a dam contractor, an engineer, and they wanted to fix it. They were, I guess, pretty well off. They figured they're willing to spend uh, 20000 to repair it. They were hit with a bill for $2 million. <gasps> $2 million to fix this dam yes, here. Because it's all undercut, the whole foundation of the dam. Mm -hmm. So they would have to dismantle it, rebuild the foundation, and then re, uh, reassemble the dam. And so they said, forget it. And I said, how can I help you? And then behind it is the former impoundment. That's where the dam was probably for 100 years or more. Or more. That's an old dam. And then, and then so they made so, the And then around that time, they said, uh, I said, they weren't sure if they, the, they owned the, the far side. So I said, I will check that out and I'll discuss it with you. Then COVID came, and, but I kept going back to their dam. And so they made the decision to- Not yet, not yet, not at this point. They just made it recently, the other day. All right. Last week or so. This is, let's see. Freshwater mussels. This is the other picture I have. Yep. Maybe there's, so am I, am I jumping the gun here by showing? No, 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 not at all. This is the creek. After the impound, the, the pond drained, the creek found its channel and it revegetated. The owner said within 30 days, it started to revegetate. All that sediment is filled with seed and natural seed. And so here we are. So this is, as you say, nature is- A is of artist, vacuum, yeah. Artist, right, artist. And it moves quickly to restore oh, yes. itself. Yeah, I just thought that was a really... Wait, do you have the other ones that show the, the greenery? No, not that one. That was another one. I sent out uh, some emails recently, last week or so. If, mm -hmm. you, if you search my name, I'll send, I sent out some, a dam. Then you'll see those three pictures. It's magnificent. Um, what, do you remember the title of the email? I have Breach Dam. I Breach have... Dam. Okay. Great. Let me pull these up. So is this a this is a tributary to the Fishkill Creek, or no, this that is the Fishkill. Fish that Kill is Creek. the headwaters of the Fishkill. Uh huh. Wow. Way up. Way up. Here we go. So that's what we were just looking at, right? Oh my gosh. This is within 30 that days. That was April 28th, that picture. And, and this was, right, the winter. March, month. sometime in March. Mm -hmm. And then, as you can see, and then look at the next one. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Isn't that lovely? And, and how you long can see the cattails uh, on, if you're facing the image, on the right-hand side, they're coming through. There's poplar trees starting to sprout. And then come fall, we're going to be planting a couple of hundred little trees on both sides of this. This is going to be a paradise. And what we've done is we have reconnected a floodplain with its river. And this river was always in restive resistance to that dam and finally broke free. So what are the fish that are now well, there's, there? There's probably... Uh, there's probably wild brook trout or wild trout in there. There's a uh, native minnows, darters and uh, minnows and things like that. And then what we want is the American eels to have their habitat back. And we want the eels to be, come back. 
Eels are in significant decline and they're historically important. I'll give you an example of how, how little they are, how much reduced they are. I was reading some historic uh, references in 1804 in the black dirt area of New Jersey on the Wallkill River. They were catching 2,000 eels a night up to eight pounds. You will not find an eel up there anymore. They're gone because of all the dams on the river. So we went from 2,000 eels a night, oh. eight pounds, they're probably this thick around, they're gone. And what we have done to eels in general is we reduced their habitat by one third, and now they, they have declined by 75%. So how many, there are several dams along this. Oh, there's quite a few. Creek, right? Starts with the Rondout, which leads in the trip, uh, the walk hills are, uh, feeds into the Rondout. So it starts with the Rondout, then there's Sturgeon Pool, which is a hundred foot dam. Then there's the Walden Dam. And there's a whole series of dams. Mm -hmm. And they're not getting past these hydroelectric power plants very well. A little, there might be one or two or three. I think about three eels have been caught above those two hydropower dams. Mm -hmm. No, I, I was actually referring to uh, the Fishkill Creek. If you were really to restore the habitat, wouldn't you need to remove all the dams along the creek? No, no. Uh, you see, every dam benefits. And in that beautiful area, we're going to plant trees. So we're going to put the tree cover back. So that would be good for the trout up in those headwaters and the native fishes and the amphibians. Um, will it help migratory fish? Maybe eels. But uh, what we've done down lower is we've engaged with the hydroelectric companies and we've said we've reached a settlement where we're forcing them to put screens on their turbines and an eel ladder to go over their dam. Mm -hmm. So what, what we're doing is reconnecting that river. So, uh, so then so, but what I always say, every dam we remove threatens the ones above and below it because I'm coming for them next. So what role does do the watershed councils play in these local, for example? Huge, huge. they're tremendous. Remember what I said about conservation? Mm -hmm. Our conservation efforts are not enough. We have to foster partnerships and engage the community to convince them that we need their power. Nothing is done in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. We need the power of the people to sway the governments and the administrations and the municipalities and to, to provide the movement to create change. So for people who don't know, can you explain what a watershed council does? Well, you guys might know better than me <laughs> on that. On that uh, you know, what a watershed council, I, I guess there, it's a stakeholder group mm -hmm. that uh, decides what is best for all stakeholders, whether it's the wildlife and the people and the people who live along that uh, uh, river and what's best for the river itself and the users of that river. Remember, that river is a public trust resource and it belongs to everybody. Mm -hmm. Nobody owns the water. Unfortunately, these dams do uh, impair that river and they impair the ecological health of it. They thermally and chemically impair a dam. A dam that chemically and thermally impairs the water. It creates an impoundment which heats up and it, you move, remove the trees and it becomes like a, the, the sun just heats it up. Mm -hmm. And then these native fishes that require a, a, na a natural flow regime have lost their habitat. And so, and then it's chemically impaired. When, when you heat it up and you add nutrients, you get um, uh, oxygen depletion. So they can't live in that mm -hmm. water. We're seeing that in the Hudson River today. There were so many complaints mm -hmm. about dead fish in the Hudson River. What's causing that? In this case, it's a, it was a, a perfect storm of heat, sewage, and prolonged drought. And combining all together creates a bloom and bust cycle of phytoplankton. And now the fish are dying. And same thing kind of happens in these, uh, if you picture the Walkill River, 
it's a perfect example. Look, mm -hmm. if you look at that water, it's green, it's pea soup green, and you get harmful algal blooms. Right. And that's all caused by the dams and yeah. excess nutrients. Mm -hmm. So the dams make the problem even worse. You know, I noticed on your map, on the map, that, um, let's see if I can share that. Um, there's this map of, uh, of all of the, and I shared it a few minutes ago. Uh, there's of all those of dams? dams, of all the dams in the, is yeah. That, uh, there's a lot of culverts on there. Can you explain well, to us a little bit about the role of culverts in all of this? Dams are worse than culverts, but mm -hmm. what happens is a culvert becomes perched. Because say that it's a tube running under, if it's not seated properly, the water pours out and starts to erode the stream bed. So now it creates a drop. Once it creates a drop, the fish can't get into that tube. So it becomes a barrier or a disconnect under the road. Mm -hmm. And if you think there are 1,600 dams, there are over 20,000 culverts in the Hudson Valley. Right, so for people looking at our screen, those are all the green stars. The right? culverts? Yeah, I think so, right? Oh, there's a lot yeah. more than that. There's a lot. These are probably the, the problem ones. There's, there's like 20,000 culverts. Right, but I mean, what I mean is these are the ones that are mapped uh, and maybe identified as at least- Oh, they're probably mapped around, yes. Okay. George, are those purple? uh shapes potential environmental justice areas i can't no these are, these are i believe there's are towns that might be for example on the these look like they're on the wappinger creek no why do you have well, who knows i could that, i think that's poughkeepsie what yeah. you there uh i don't know what that that purple is i think it is i think it is is there a way yeah, to go it looks like it's part of the wappinger creek watershed but i'm not sure what the reason for the mapping is if i'm looking go at back to quick to the key click, click wappinger and let's go yeah. back to the main key and see i don't think that whole thing is environmental justice that's just my no, opinion no no scroll down because these are um uh, scroll down these are the field assessment oh, okay. areas. Oh, okay, field assessment areas, yeah. Interesting. So, you know, George, looking at this and hearing you speak, I and I, I always, I love hearing, you're just so passionate. You're an artist to me yeah. in your work and um, and your understanding of, of, you know, the connections that have to be made with the community and spending the time to build those trusting relationships it's really everything and it's not easy it takes time and it takes yeah, understanding yeah, yeah you, you know every community is a different almost a different language it has different it, it there's no cookie cutter communities so if i were listening to this and hearing about dams and seeing this map for the first time i would say to myself where are the dams where i live so, and then I would maybe access this map and take a look. What are the things, because we want to encourage more community engagement on all of these issues. And there's so many issues that okay. everybody should be able to find the one that, that, that is, makes them as passionate as it makes you. So if you were to- Yeah, but there's a problem. Tell me, yeah. There's a big problem. Uh, everybody's chief investment is their house. And what happens is people are used to seeing that dam and that impoundment, and they have a lot of memories attached to it. And they're resistant to change. And some people, no matter what, don't want that dam removed. And it becomes a problem. And so how do you create the dialogue? And that's where the community is really important. And you have to um, look even at the environmental justice. Most of the people who want a dam live upstream of one. And what happens generally is those who live downstream are the impoverished. Yeah. So the people, the wealthy people are concerned about their investment, their house, and the people who are impoverished who live downstream in the poorer areas, which were 
habitually poor and for people of color. And they're, what they want to do is just survive. So the people upstream don't really care about the people downstream and they're worried about their investment. So how do you broker this? Well, you gotta look, where's the greater good here? Well, if I were new to this subject, what, what's occurring to me is I would look at, I, I'd be curious about the dams in my area and what dams might exist that could be choking, um, you know, a tributary to the Hudson, right? We're in the city of Kingston. I would look at this map and I think what, what I would instinctually wanna do is reach out to someone like you and to understand the history and, and is there any work being done on the dam near me and how can I help, right? Like, so, so this seems like the good steps because there's really no cookie cutter solution to what can you do? There it's is no cookie cutter solution. But what we're, hoping, <clears throat> what we're hoping to do is build a momentum. We really haven't had primary barriers removed in the Hudson Valley. Give it time. We're gonna have examples and that is gonna become contagious. There are lots of dams in the process right now, in the hopper, waiting to be removed. It's a slow process and that whole permitting process is slow. And when these start coming, I think more and more people are gonna get on board and realize this is really good. So and George, when you're about to take one, uh, when a dam, can you give us an example of a, you don't have to say which one if you'd rather not, but if there's a dam in the process of being removed, what is that process? You, you mentioned some permits. Oh, what there's, a, there's a huge process involved. Uh, and you know what's, what's interesting? When nature removes a dam, it's usually one great big violent kinetic burst and all that potential energy turns into kinetic energy and the water rushes downstream. And that's gonna happen more and more frequently because climate change is increasing, the storm intensity is increasing, uh, the frequency of rainfall is increasing. increasing. So we have, uh, rainfall has increased by 80% in the Northeast in the past 30 years. The intensity and frequency of severe storms is increasing. These dams were not built for these structural tolerances. Right. So they're starting to breach, like this one breached last year. The average age of the dam in the Hudson Valley is 56 years old. And a lot of them are now cracking, they're spalling, they're breaking. And so what we say is we got to remove them in a controlled fashion rather than let nature do it. So, uh, so the process is we convince the owners or I, I convince the state, they offer money, grant money to remove dams. They understand it's a problem. So we, we create, we uh, submit an uh, an RFP, we, we come up with an RFP to remove a dam after we get an agreement by the owner or the municipality. And that's just the beginning. And then here comes the hysterical, so, so, I'm sorry, the historical society. I call them the hysterical society because they wanna preserve that dam at all cost. And then there's SHPO and they look at archeological stuff. And, you know, a lot of these things have 200 years of industrial activity. There's very little archeological uh, remains left below after that 200 years of industrial activity. But, you know, we, we go through that and then we have to go through NOAA and, uh, and the Fish and Wildlife. NOAA? Can you, can NOAA you is National uh, Ocean, Oceanographic uh, something. It, they, they're in charge of marine fisheries. Yeah. Atmospheric Administration, Ocean. National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. They're in charge of marine fisheries. So especially endangered fisheries, we have to worry about uh, sturgeon and um, mm -hmm. both species of sturgeon. And then uh, I have to worry about endangered species in the riparian corridor for the US Fish and Wildlife. And you have to promise that you won't harm them, you won't cut tree, big trees. And then you get, you get signed off by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Army Corps of Engineers. Then you file for a, a joint application to the state. And then they investigate it. And then you come up with a detailed plan how you're going to remove this. And then there's a seeker permit. 
So there's multiple, multiple layers. And this is a long, cumbersome process. Mm -hmm. And it's so burdensome. It makes the removal. Other states have moved beyond this, and they've made it much easier. And that's what we want New York State to move in that direction, to remove these dams. And I mentioned climate change. The best thing you can do in climate change, the mitigation of this, is to remove the dam. Because when you remove the dam, you drop the water level equal to the level of that dam. And you take all that massive, massive kinetic energy, a potential energy in that impoundment that's going to rush downhill 40 miles per hour and taking everything like a juggernaut. You remove that and where that impoundment was is now that floodplain and it becomes a storage area for more rain. So you reduce the creek, you remove the impoundment and create a storage area. You and know, you rewild everything. So everybody wins. Well, as a matter of fact, in, in High Falls, um, you know, there's a pretty massive one and the, the hydroelectric dam. And when, when, it, when it floods, the, there's an area around the golf course yeah. and Stone Dock Road where people's homes are flooded up to their, the middle of their kitchen cabinets, homes that are well above the creek. So it really, really rises. And I was just wondering if you've looked at how, uh, what happens if that, well, obviously you're not necessarily going to remove removing that particular dam, but what would be the difference if that dam were removed? Again, that dam, a dam is designed to raise the water level. So however high that dam is, mm -hmm. you raise the water level on the backside of it by that equivalent amount. Okay. And so when you get a, a rain, it's, it's already filled up that impoundment. It doesn't have room to, to expand. Mm -hmm. And it comes down in a torrent. And the problem is when it starts overflowing um, the abutments, it starts being very erosive. Right. And it starts working on the structure of that dam. And it impacts people who live along or in that area. Mm -hmm. During COVID, so by, I'm yeah. sorry, so by removing that dam, you lower the water level. Mm -hmm. much much lower so those people who would, were flooded would no longer be flooded and i was just wondering about these hydroelectric dams if there's um you know what's what's the relationship of your work to the trying to convince people that hydroelectric power is not clean and green yep i will tell you that hydroelectric dams are the only form of renewable energy sending species to extinction displacing people globally and contributing to climate change. Those impoundments release methane gas and carbon dioxide. And those waterfalls vaporize the methane and carbon dioxide. So, and methane is 80 times more potent of a, a, of a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So if you think it's clean and green, it's not. You're severely mistaken and it really impacts the ecology as well as the atmosphere. George, we need to bring George into the Ulster County Legislature. <laughs> That's sure. what we need to do next, George. Well, we need to. I'm telling you, I'm gonna. I, I, you're. You've got to. You've got to get get everywhere. You've got to be every. Well, that's what I like to do. I like to get out and talk to people. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, in in some ways, my best my best education. Edu education wasn't grad school, my PhD. It was in the NYPD because it taught me how to talk to people. Right, right. All different, all different groups of people. And uh, I think that's what we're missing, the ability to convey and communicate our messages. George, where were you, where were you um, an officer in New York, in the city, in, in, in one of the boroughs? Where uh, well, I had a, a variety of jobs, but whenever I was on patrol, I was in uh, uh, East New York, Brownsville, Bed-Stuy, and then, but I was also, um, I also rode horses and I taught self-defense uh, in the police academy. But riding horses was my, one of my favorite jobs. Fantastic. And you're also a professor, you're teaching too, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I teach ecology uh, and evolution at Queens College. Wow, you really do it all, George. Amazing guy. <laughs> well, you know, I got a message. You know, life is short. 
Yeah. And uh, I'll be asleep for a long time, so I got got I got a lot of work to do. <laughs> George, you are an inspiration, and we thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Rebecca. It's a pleasure to work with you, and 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 I really I love you as a person and a and a colleague, and uh, and it's been a pleasure to have me to be on your on your this round table. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, and we're going to, you're welcome. It's an, really an, uh, an honor to have you on our program. And we're, we'll share, Jenny, we'll share um, information for the public, what we're seeing here. We'll send um, community members to the dam removal page where they can watch this terrific film on damming the Hudson uh, right. that I think will really inspire uh, anyone who's, who's coming to this issue for the first time and maps and also your contact info, George. Yep. Um, uh, and especially if you're a community member living in the Hudson River watershed, which is 13,000 square miles. And, and, if, and, that, and yeah. if they got a dam they want me to look at, somebody, I gotta go look at a dam, somebody called me up, a watchdog said, this dam's in bad shape, could you take a look at it? And that's where I'm heading out tomorrow <clears throat> to look at somebody's, uh, some dam on state property. Yeah, and I think that's it. What we're gonna do our best to send more people to you, inquisitive questions, etc. And I, I will see you in the office Zoom. I some... will see you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I hope much. to see you too, George. Yes, Jennifer. It was so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I hope you. to see you in person. Yep. Bye bye. Bye, George. Bye bye. Bye, bye. bye, -bye Jennifer. Bye. Okay. Wow. I, it, what did I tell you? Yeah. It, he's Beautiful person. Oh my gosh. I, can, I can't say how anybody could uh, close the door on him. No. I don't think they do. I could think he's, he's so tenacious and, and cares so much that it sounds, you, you know, just his story about how he found a, a conversation that opened the door just through his tenacity of showing up and showing up and showing up and keeping it going. I mean, George is, he's the best. He thinks about everything. He's so thoughtful and um, we're really lucky to have him. And I was, I was relaying that story the first time he was, he came into Riverkeeper because I feel the same way. I mean, Riverkeeper's mission is so important to me. And I, when I, when I took a job there, when I was lucky enough to get a job there and took it, I couldn't believe it because Kate Hudson, as you and I know, the, the attorney, the environmental attorney was really uh, pivotal in our Niagara bottling right. uh, campaign and just learning the law. That was one aspect of it. You brought in the economic development expertise and we had a great team of people who did all sorts of things. But Kate was the introduction to Seeker for me, even though I know you we're familiar with Seeker too, but for some reason that just, that was the moment where it, it came into view. Um, and she worked at Riverkeeper at that time. Well, he and, said something really important. Um, and he said it right from the beginning. Well, he said many really important takeaways. One of course was that his love of nature was born of being, um, being engaged in recreation with nature, which is why environmental groups promote recreation, fishing, and so on, even hunting, so that people are in, con in contact with nature in a way that helps them appreciate their relationship to it. And another thing that he said that's, of course, so important is how to build coalitions as part of what you want to get done. So he brings in a lot of different groups and also the retail politics aspect of it, of, you know, not knocking on doors and just having those one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, that's a such a big part of the work and river keepers work most environmental groups would not succeed if it weren't for the grassroots boots on the ground so that's right that's the that's the key and i think uh yeah i need to travel with him sometime and see how he does what he does i think it's it would be great if i can ever get out of the papers, the paperwork. Yeah. Anyway, I hope you learned a lot, Jenny. I hope you had a... Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Really yeah. great. Really interesting. And I recommend that people visit that page. It's right on Riverkeeper's page. 
about uh, dam removal, you can just Google that or go to Riverkeeper's page because it has some great videos. It has the interactive map and uh, it shows what people are doing all around the world to remove dams. Yeah, we'll share those links too in the video in the um, in the below the video. We always put links from the show. Mm -hmm. And I encourage you to reach out to George um, if you're interested in the subject and um, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll put that information there too. And Jenny, I'm heading out uh, for a little rest. Um, I hope you're going to have a, a restful holiday weekend too. Yes, absolutely. And we will let the public know what we have in store Next. as uh, the summer evolves. Yes, that's, that sounds perfect. I will say, uh, because I don't mind tipping the hand, that if you ever glanced at the books behind me one of my favorite subjects is uh architectural history and critical theory which is essentially the criticism of um of politics let's say and economics in relation to modern era and um the subject of removing monuments is very important to me. Uh, it's part of the work I did in cultural studies and urban planning. And so I'm hoping that we can pull together a discussion on that. And that if anybody's fun. interested in joining us on that, maybe we can make it a bit of a round table conversation. Just get in touch with me through Rebecca. Yeah, and I, we can put your email address up too. Right. And as always, Jenny, thank you so much. Thank and you. Uh, I look forward to Lynn returning with us too. Mm -hmm. um, and we will continue on. Okay. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks for joining in. Hold on. <laughs>